There you go. So you've just introduced that. So I'm Zoe Walker. I'm an associate data science product manager, which kind of means a junior one. Sounds bigger than it is in the Ministry of Justice. If you want to go to the next slide, I can I'm talk a little bit about me and where I come from. So I started off as a sociology graduate in the um, University of Manchester. And then I moved to the national, oh, is it? It seems to be um, uh, feeding back on me. I don't know whether that's because someone's not muted. Um, so then I um, moved into the National Probation Service and had a few jobs in there. First as a receptionist, um, a probation service officer, a few of those things down there, but basically ended up as a probation officer specialising in working with 18 to 25 year old males who are at risk of custody, supervising them on sentences, trying to get them through, trying to stop them offending. Um, I then moved through into working in the performance and quality part of the National Probation Service as a senior probation officer. Um, I did sort of audits on other people's work, um, helped with reviews of serious further offences. So that's when someone commits a really serious offence whilst we're on probation, we do a review to see uh, whether or not we could have done anything different. And then I was a performance manager, otherwise known as the target lady. Um, so I was tracking people's performance uh, through the Northwest on various different metrics. And that's when I really became involved in data, data quality, patterns in data and what data could do for us. Um, I then um, ended up becoming, a, I put a proxy product manager. I was a subject matter expert that was brought on to think of how to design a tool which could help people make better decisions when sentencing offenders, when proposing sentences for offenders. Um, and I ended up becoming the product manager because there, there wasn't one really. Um, so uh, that used a rule-based algorithm. Um, but through that, um, I'm working on that for three years. I've just recently moved into the Ministry of Justice in the data science hub um, as an associate data science product manager, which is a new job for me, but it's also a new role in the Ministry of Justice, so that I think there's only two of us, and a new kind of role anyway, the idea, concept of a data science product manager. So if you go to the next slide, um, to date, so what I've learned through that journey is, there's little point in creating decision-making tools that use artificial intelligence, if people won't use them, if they don't trust them, and if they don't believe they need them, and if you can't track any of those things. Um, but the good news is that digital design, the actual uh, design of something digitally that you can put that AI tool in, or the AI tools in, can help in all these ways. Um, and the useful theories that I'm um, going to talk about today are EAST, these are the behavioural psychology theories, um, algorithm aversion and illusory superiority. So if you just move on to the next slide. So first of all, how do you encourage someone, someone to do something? So there was a, um, a behavioural insights team that was set up with David Cameron's government, also known as the Nudge Unit. And they basically came up with this concept of EAST. And what they're saying here is, if you want to encourage somebody to do something in any way, not just digitally, you need to make it easy, you need to make it attractive, social and timely. And a really good example of one of the, the way they did this was about getting tax. They wanted to try and encourage people to pay their tax. And the way that they did that is they changed the letter that they sent to people. So they put a link within the letter to make it easier for people to pay their tax. That's the easy bit. Timely, they sent it at a particular time when people were thinking about paying their tax rather than way in advance. Um, attractive doesn't mean that they make it good looking or anything. It means that they, ch they changed the format of the letter to attract people's attention to the thing that they wanted to know. And the really clever thing they did was social. Basically, they put on the letter, 90% of people like you in this situation pay their tax on time. And by doing that, they had an increase in tax being paid. So next slide, how can we apply this to digital design? So I'm gonna give you some examples from the last tool that I made. So easy wise, we basically made it easier to do the preferred behavior than not. So we had more steps within the interface um, to override what uh, we were suggesting than go with it. Although we were still allowing people to, to do what they wanted, it was just a bit more of a faff. Um, attractive, we would put, we had a, a sort of recommendations list and we put priority suggestions at the top of the short list. Um, so people like a Google search are more likely to click on the ones at the top. And also you can attract attention through other things like size, icon and colour, although colours in brackets, because for assisted technology, it's not always, you need to have something else other than colour because it doesn't always work. People don't always respond to it. 
Um, for the timely element, it was kind of difficult because it was an off the shelf standalone tool, but we did focus the performance measures that we were pushing on the most timely period that we wanted people to do it. So thinking of like, when do we really want people to use this tool? Let's, let's have a look at what they're doing at that period rather than in general. Um, good ideas for digital design to make it timely is being able to link from one task to another screen really quickly, make it frictionless and not standalone. And another thing that we had was alerts. So if there was something that somebody needed to do, they would get sent an alert so they'd go and use the tool at the right time. And then the final thing, social. It's, we, we, we changed the language that we used. So for example, there was a, an assessment that probation officers were encouraged to do called SARA, which is about assessing someone's risk of domestic violence. And people didn't do that. We allow people to not do it, but we asked them a question as to why. And in the questions as to why we didn't put, because they're female, we put, I didn't think it was for females because what a lot of people didn't know is that they should be doing the assessment even on female offenders they didn't realize it we wanted to allow them to show us that but the way that we worded it it kind of uh, it, it triggered something in their head that, oh so is it for females and we got a lot of people that would contact us and we sort of improved practice that way we had an mi system that showed how low override levels were so people would gem how low how, how often people tended to go with what we what we asked for rather than not and we gave easy access to stats of uptake so we had a graph on the front page that showed how many would be being done every every day and we exposed people to that so on the next slide so that's how you can get someone to use something or do something but how do you then encourage someone to trust it so there's a fear that artificial intelligence is going to take over the world but that's a bit premature and actually a lot of research done recently consistently shows that people ignore algorithms in decision-making tools or refuse to trust them. And that's a phenomenon called algorithm aversion. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is the iteration. So sort of gradually improving your algorithm so it gets more and more clever. It's, it's hard to do. It's harder to do it in the public eye for data science tools. So if you have a software, tool that you're creating it starts off simple and then gradually gets gets a bit sort of fancier people give, have a lot more sort of grace and favor for that they'll understand that but studies show there's much lower benefit of the doubt threshold and tolerance for error when it comes to using something that's got an algorithm if it gets it wrong the first time people's trust zooms down so in some respects, you only get one chance to make a first impression but we need to iterate so there are ways that you can Put things into the design that will try and curb people's tendency to just immediately mistrust it. So the next question is why do people not trust AI and what can you do to encourage trust from the very first iteration of your tool? So first of all the reasons for algorithm aversion. There was a great study in 2019 where they brought together all of the, the um, research done at that point and basically figured out that there was kind of five general reasons why people don't trust algorithms. The first one is what I call old school expectations and experience, otherwise known as I'd rather ask old Bob. So people were much more likely to ask a person that they knew that a human being that had expertise in that area rather than a machine that had expertise. And it's not just because they're human, although that is a reason in itself it's because of people understand humans capacity to learn they understand that if bob gives them an answer and it turns out to be wrong they can tell bob bob will go oh yeah and he won't do it next time but they have less of an understanding that algorithms will do that too that you can actually keep learning the next one is lack of incentive so it takes me more time what's in it for me that's a general reason why we don't do a lot of things um, there's the need for decision of autonomy. So people will, would say, you know, I want to have the final say um, and or I want to fiddle with it. I want to fiddle with, you know, with, with how it's making its, its decision. Um, and so they want that decision autonomy. That's why they don't trust it. Cognitive incompatibility is really interesting. So I've basically got here, like, how did it come up with that? And it's the idea that if it, people don't understand how the algorithm is making its decision, it doesn't sort of concur with the, the intuitive way that you would make a decision, then they're less likely to understand it and therefore trust it. And then the final thing is this, this idea of different 
worlds of risk v uncertainty. So the idea of risk, uncertainty and uncertainty in algorithms is very different to, to, to humans. So we're much more likely to err on the side of caution rather than have quite a black and white idea of, of, of the risk of something. So the next slide is what can you do about this? So these are some of the things that we did in our tool. Old school expectations and experience. First of all, it's about teaching people about the concept of unconscious bias. So the fact that humans do have unconscious bias and, and your decisions will be made with unconscious bias and therefore it's a way of trying to combat or mitigate that. And you can also provide information that compares what you're doing to the level of human error of doing the same task or decision. But what we also did is we allowed feedback with the ability to improve the algorithm there and then. So people to say, it didn't come up with what I thought and this is why I think it should do. We then also fed back that by you said we did emails and we provided a human link. So we actually had, we had an email, um, we had um, data analysts that would come, come back to people if they had queries to try and provide that human accountability and link behind the algorithm so that they knew there was people involved. For lack of incentive, it's difficult because if you're not going to give money, what are you going to do? And we work in the public sector and that is not um, a thing, but it's about the social aspect. So it, to incentivize people, if you have good feedback on, on, on your algorithm and it's really important to share it, provide reviews, but also social statistics showing how much other people are using it, that's actually more powerful than human error stats. Um, the next thing about need for decision autonomy, what you can do is a number of things. You can have open inputs. You can allow people to change some inputs. What the study suggested that about 5% of the ability to change can actually improve people's trust. Or you can have an interactive sandbox, which is the idea that the algorithm says a certain thing based on the, on the input. Um, but, um, but people can go and sort of, aside from that, try out what would happen if they change things around without actually changing the actual thing. So they're able to sort of see what happens if I move this up and down. And the final thing we did is we allowed override, that's really important. We allow people to go off piece, as I call it, um, but we made them explain why and made sure that's been recorded and tracked. For cognitive incompatibilities, some of the things you can do is list inputs in a natural way that humans would ask questions. So if we're talking about people, we tend to think about what their name is, then what their gender is, then what their age is. Even if your algorithm is weighting them in differently, if you're going to show people the inputs, you try it in an intuitive manner. Um, uh, you can make that black box white. Um, and there's a really good paper at the bottom there, which is uh, strategies for examples of how you can make a white box interface. Um, so basically a way to explain the, uh, the algorithm that's understandable. Um, and if you're going to go for different models and you've got an option, what I would always try and do is opt for the more explainable model than the super duper black box model. Um, and then we also had this thing called, I don't understand why not suitable. So this is when people overrode, they went for something else. And then we asked them why, we gave them the option to say, I don't understand why that wasn't suitable. Um, so it gave them an opportunity. We it then alerted our data analysts and they as human to human contacted them via email and said, the reason it didn't come up is because of this, this and this. So giving that um, extra um, information. And then the final thing, different worlds about risk. Well, this is kind of a difficult one. In some ways, we have to accept there's different ways of making decisions in different environments. And that's not just human to algorithm, that's sort of in fast paced environments, people make decisions in a different way or using different fields, if you like, than in, 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 in long-term ones. So if people are risk averse, she can consider what's the closest match to the human's level of caution and, and don't absolutely replicate it because you might have more information that they would, but basically, um, think about what you're trying to do with your, what your algorithm and if you're going to look at the performance of it, whether you're going to go for precision or recall. And I knew nothing about precision recall, but the way I figure it out is precision is like, say, if you think about it as fishing, so you're going fishing, precision is you put your net in and it only catches fish. It doesn't catch any rubbish, but it does let some of the fish out. But it's more important that the only thing you catch is fish. With re recall, it's, it's more important that you catch every fish 
even if you also catch some rubbish. And in order to just, and, and if you can figure out what your users are wanting, whether they're wanting precision or recall, and you use that as the way that you're gonna um, uh, improve your model, then obviously that's gonna help. Okay, next slide, please. So they trust it now, they accept that it has less errors than humans, and they, people may accept it's, best, it's based on best practice or policy, but they still don't feel that they need it. So why is that? This is an example um, of that that's come from the um, Wall Street Journal, um, for the links down there, that, uh, that was done very recently, some research about the impossible trust threshold for self-driving cars. So they did a study and asked people when they would use them. And if they cause 10% less accidents than humans, only 11% of people would use them. If they halved the rate of accidents to 50%, then only 37% of people would opt in. And a, and a massive 15% of people would need a perfect 100% no accidents before they would use them. So why is that? Next slide, please. It's because of this concept called illusory superiority, which is another theory. And I've put in a couple of quotes there to kind of give you an idea. So the first one is from When Harry Met Sally. And I love When Harry Met Sally. Um, and Carrie Fisher says, everybody thinks they have good taste and a sense of humour, but they couldn't possibly all have good taste and a sense of humour. And then the other one is from the veritable yogi bear, better than the average bear. So illusory superiority is the... The, the case when people would rather trust themselves than a machine, even if the machine shows less error rates in general because of a better than average effect, we basically have an inflated sense of our own skills compared with others. So what that means is average stats will only go so far to convince us as we tend to think that we are better than average in our skills. And that's why even if you can provide all the information, people think that they would still be able to make a better decision so how can you combat illusory superiority? So next slide, please. So it's very difficult, but there's some things that you can do to mitigate it. So one of the things I used to do is in user research, you can ask people if they think an AI solution would be good, not just for them, but for others, these others, that would generally provide a more honest response about how much of a problem it is. Um, I did some research where I would say, you know, obviously, you know, you make the right decisions, but do you think that this, younger colleagues, newer colleagues, people from other areas, if you've got any examples when you think it would have been really great if they could have had this, and then people will talk more and about, about its benefits, and that can some, sometimes um, um, help. You can show people their own stats in comparison to the average, but that still only goes so far. And actually what this paper showed was actually sometimes you need to change the purpose focus. So what we try to do, it's difficult if you're working on something that's going to be customers and they've got nothing in common and they don't care about each other. But when you're working in an organisation like we are, where everyone else is kind of working for a collective goal, if you can change the purpose focus of the tool from personal gain to for the greater good, you can foster a collective improvement as a goal rather than individual. And then people are more likely to get on board and realise the need. So next slide, please. So once you've done all of this, so they're using it, they're trusting it and they feel that they need it, you then need to track people's engagement. And there's two kinds of, 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 of ways to do that. User confidence and user override, and they're not the same thing. So user confidence is when people say they either liked or did not like the suggestions that they're getting. Either they think that the, that the algorithm or the decision-making tool or whatever is seems understandable and intelligent, or they think it's unclear or it's stupid, you know, they don't get it. User override is slightly different in that that's when you measure whether someone did or did not go for what you suggested in the end. So you can have people that think that the suggestions are intelligent, but they don't go for them. And ideally you need to track both because by tracking both, you get to figure out what your problem is and what things you might need to do to combat that. So I've put them together on this little table to give you an idea. So the first thing is, Low user confidence, so people you track that and you find that people don't like the suggestions, they don't think they're understandable, and also high override and they don't go with them. So that's a classic case of algorithm aversion. We've talked about ways that you can mitigate that. But then you can also have people where the user confidence, if you ask them if they if they if they um, thought that it was intelligent, they would say yes, but yet they still override. 
because they know better. That's illusory superiority, and we've talked about that. There is another one, which is where people have low user confidence, so they don't really trust the, um, the tool, but they still go for it anyway. And that's what I call compliance culture. And that's quite dangerous. And that can happen in places where people are quite used to being told what to do, or they're, they're not, they're um, sort of entry level, you know, using the tool, or they lack confidence. And that can be dangerous, depending on how strongly you are nudging people to do something in the tool. So if you find that, then what you need to do is try and open up and, in, in, and encourage override, encourage professional judgment, as we call it, allow people the opportunity to um, uh, change the interface so it's not quite as harsh, um, because that means that people are actually not going with something and not feeling comfortable with doing it anyway. The sweet spot is when you have high user confidence, so people trust it, and then also low override, and they're going with what you're saying. So what I would say is if you do have algorithms that are going into an interface, these are kind of riders for me. I wouldn't launch an AI tool without developing a tracking system for at least one of these things, but preferably both. Um, not just because it means that you can track and it's good metric and stuff, but it's actually quite dangerous if you're not tracking how people are using it. Um, so on to the next slide, what are some of the ways that you can digitally track user engagement? And I've just pluck these out of the air about things that we've probably all seen. So user confidence, thumbs up, thumbs down. So if you see like, do you like this? Do you not like this? Um, sort of Netflix stuff. You can also do star ratings, although they don't test as well, because let's be honest, who has the time to go, am I, is it a three? Is it either do I, is it good or is it not good? That's much easier for people to use. Why am I seeing this? You'll see this on Facebook. That's like when you've been given something um, uh, like a, an advert and you can look at why you've seen that, that that's showing that people are wary about how it's made its decision um, you can also do good old-fashioned before and after user surveys but make sure that you ask if they feel it's useful for others not just for themselves and then there's some page clicks if you can do page clicks or if not just good old-fashioned user observation of people using your tool you want to see whether or not they go off to double check things so they, they they've got the, the decision tool in front of them but they go i'll just check and they'll go onto another screen somewhere in in that case management system to check something else that the algorithm is taking into account but they just want to check um, and then also you can track if they go to read the explainability of an algorithm if you provided this this white box like how often people are feeling that they want to look at that which is obviously that's that's not bad to look at that, but you want to see whether or not it reduces over time with users that have been using the tool for a while. User override is a bit more easy to do. So first of all, uh, we categorised our choices. So we did we we had the preferred suggestion, <coughs> a sort of top spot, and you'd have a, you'd have that. You, you might then also have other suggestions that are recommended but not the top spot. Um, and then you might have other things that you saying are not recommended, but you still allow people to choose them. What you need to make sure is that your interface captures those as, is separately um, in the data. So you can tell whether people went for preferred, recommended, not recommended. Um, we also had conditional pop-ups for a few things that we really wanted to look at. So when people don't choose the top spot option, um, we'd have a pop-up saying, why did you not choose it? And if people, chose something that wasn't recommended so they went for something that we didn't suggest at all and um, we asked why the why did you deviate from that and then you can also have we set up deviation alerts so as i said before if people deviated and they said the reason they deviated was this particular reason we had an extra way of tracking that on top of people just overriding in general we were particularly interested in that so all of those things were kind of built in, the, the developer built those in for, for me. So we were able to have a good handle on what's going on. So the next slide is just now a summary of what I've said. So basically, if it's about getting people to use something, we're talking about the East or the nudge theory. If it's about trying to improve trust, it's worth thinking about those concept, that concept of algorithm aversion. If it's about need, Need is all about illusory superiority. And then if you're going to track something, make sure that you're looking for user confidence and override as well. And that is the end of my presentation. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions on anything. <laughs>